Okay, thank you. So I will um, say a few words about um, building an atlas of the brain. Um, I will say a few words about our uh, experience uh, doing this kind of work in, in the mouse and about what you can use it for. Um, and then a little bit about the specific design considerations for a human brain atlas. Um, so I'm going back to this slide, which is from the white paper um, and, and the way that, that we've been discussing and thinking about uh, atlasing in general for, for the human cell atlas. So um, essentially we, we have two branches. One is for discovering cell types using single cell RNA sequencing. Um, and, and we know quite a lot about that, how to do it, um, the, the, the technologies that will work, and we have scalable um, uh, processes for that. Uh, so it's pretty well um, on, on its way. Um, and then we have the other branch, which is the spatial aspect, um, which includes many challenges. Um, here um, are, are mentioned some of the technolog uh, technological challenges um, and, and possible technologies to use for this. It's much less mature than single cell RNA-seq. Uh, it doesn't scale to the level of, of the human body, uh, definitely not to the level of the human brain. Uh, so much more work is, is required there on the, on the technology side. But it also uh, what's not really mentioned on this slide is that these two branches come together um, in, the, in, the, in the coordinate framework. So you need to put together the cell types that you discover here with the spatial mapping um, uh, and sort of uh, uh, align them. And, and this is actually uh, extremely important in the brain and I think it's, the brain is also one tissue where this has been done uh, to quite a large extent and we do have pretty good uh, coordinate systems and uh, anatomical taxonomies. So uh, I, I'll show you just uh, a bit of our work uh, on the uh, mouse brain to begin with and, and then make some points about that. So we've, uh, we've been surveying the mouse nervous system um, and so uh, I started this, this talk with the first slide uh, saying that we're making an atlas of the brain but I think we need to be much more general the nervous system is spread out uh, across the body. Um, so the brain is, is, of course, a very important uh, uh, central part of the nervous system. And we've sampled this extensively in the mouse. But we also included um, peripheral nervous system, um, uh, the sensory, the sympathetic, and the enteric uh, uh, nervous system. So we're missing the parasympathetic. Um, and, and, uh, um, but otherwise, uh, we're trying to be comprehensive. And I think in the human, uh, th this is going to be even more of a challenge because these peripheral ganglia are very hard to find. In the mouse we can use genetic methods to label them so that they are bright red and we can find them. In the human we are not so lucky. <clears throat> Actually I put also on this slide um, a cartoon of the development of the brain. So the brain of course starts as the neural tube which is progressively patterned first um, on the anterior posterior axis and then on the dorsal ventral axis so you get this sort of pattern structure, and this is what generates all the diversity of the brain. And what we find increasingly is that the, uh, the, the cell types and the, and the organization of cell types in the brain reflects development to a large extent. Um, so we have uh, um, generated this data set in the mouse, and, and we have uh, uh, spent a lot of time developing the methods to, to cluster this. I'm not going to go through this in detail, just to want to point out that in the end, we can find pretty distinct clusters of cells that represent specific uh, uh, neuronal types in specific parts of the brain that use specific neurotransmitters. This is the collection of monoaminergic cell types in the, in the mouse brain. And in total, right now, we have 300 uh, odd cell types. And we like to uh, use very conservative clustering in the sense that we are not trying to make very fine distinctions about substates that are distinguished by graded expression patterns, but really try to find the broad, um, obvious categories of, of cells in the brain. So our clusters are distinguished by usually blocks of genes that have highly uh, enriched and specific gene expression um, in those cell types. Of course, there are um, always uh, border cases. So you have cell types that have very low expression of their enriched markers. Uh, this is very, very borderline. And you have these cell types that have sort of, you know, combinatorial shared expression patterns. So this is the, these are the challenges. Nevertheless, um, having uh, mapped all of these cell types in the brain, um, we can make uh, 
uh, uh, dendrogram of cell types of the mouse nervous system. This is the dendrogram of the neurons. And so this is, the tips of this dendrogram are the cell types. So there are many, many cells in each cell type here. Um, and the dendrogram is made on, on the basis of molecular uh, relatedness, so similarities of, of gene expression. The exact metric is not super important, but uh, it, it does affect the layout a little bit, but by and large the general patterns are, are highly uh, robust. And what you see, again, that I mentioned in the beginning, that uh, the, the architecture of the brain reflects very much development. So the major split is between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, and in the peripheral nervous system, we get a, a very neat split between the three different uh, classes, the sensory, the sympathetic, and the enteric, uh, as, as you might expect. Um, in the brain itself, uh, we see large blocks of cell types that have a common developmental origin. So, for example, you have the spinal cord here, you have the DNS encephalon here, you have the hindbrain here. So this branching really reflects the anterior-posterior patterning um, th that I showed in, in one of those slides. Um, in each case, it seems that the brain likes to split uh, into neurotransmitter types, so excitatory and inhibitory. You see in the spinal cord, there's a neat split between excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and the same is true in the hindbrain and the DN mesencephalon. And this, I'm not sure about the spinal cord, but in the, in the uh, brain itself, largely reflects, again, developmental processes where inhibitor neurons tend to be developed to uh, be generated ventrally. Um, there are exceptions, and those are very interesting. We have all the cholinergic and monoaminergic neurons. So these are all the neurons in the brain that use the less common neurotransmitters. So the most common ones are glutama glutamate and GABA. Um, so th it seems that the sort of standard neurons tend to align themselves with development, whereas the more non-standard monoaminergic and cholinergic neurons tend to align with each other. So there is some special process for generating those neurons, and it will be very interesting to, to study what that process is. Um, yeah, let's leave it at that. And uh, once you have cell types, you can start to make TISNIs on the cell type level. Uh, so this is not a TISNI of cells, but of cell types. And this again reveals the architecture of, of the nervous system. Um, and largely it shows the same picture. Um, you have a segregation of the peripheral nervous system versus everything else. Um, you have a largely anterior-posterior separation. You have spinal cord here, hindbrain, midbrain, um, cortex, um, and so on. And you have these cholinergic and monoaminergic neurons that end up on the side and, and tend to go together. Um, so there is a lot of stuff you can explore in this data set. And I'll just... Um, um, give a few examples. So one, one thing that you can explore in, in, in this data set because of the existence of very good resources of um, uh, gene expression, uh, spatial gene expression patterns, is that you can map these cell types to the brain um, and, and get the, a, a fairly uh, resolved picture. So these are coronal sections showing four specific cell types, so four of the cell types in that dendrogram, showing the distribution of those cells um, in the brain from the anterior to the posterior. And you'll see that uh, a specific type of olfactory neuroblast, so immature neurons that we uh, found, um, is, is found exclusively in the olfactory bulb and actually in a specific layer of the olfactory bulb. Um, neurons that we have called from the RNA-seq as thalamus excitatory neurons are very specifically located in the thalamus and so on. So this gives us the spatial axis and, and, and it, it makes it possible to integrate the spatial and the cell type information. Uh, let me skip to the astrocytes. Um, um, it is, you might think that the, the, the brain, especially the mouse brain, has been studied for 100 years. It might be hard to make uh, discoveries there in terms of cell types, but it turns out that there are really major cell types that have been uh, undiscovered for 100 years. And one of them is, is uh, a type of astrocyte that actually seems to be uh, extremely abundant, that, that's not been uh, described before to my knowledge. Um, there are specific known astrocytes in specific parts of the brains, like the Bergman glia that are in the cerebellum. Um, but it turns out that the forebrain has its own type of astrocyte. So we, we find that all of the astrocytes split into these two large clusters, and, and one of the clusters is pretty much uh, specific to the forebrain. And uh, you can actually map all of these uh, astrocyte types using the markers, again using the Allen Brain Atlas, uh, 
And this is a sagittal section, so you have the olfactory bulb here. This is the forebrain, and this is the deencephalon, um, sorry, the midbrain, uh, and, and the hindbrain going here. Here's the cerebellum. So here you see the, the Bergman glia. These are known since 100 years. Uh, these are olfactory specific um, uh, astrocytes, including the olfactory and sheathing neurons. And in green, you see this new type of forebrain specific astrocyte. Um, these are very interesting astrocytes. Um, they, in contrast to all of the other astrocytes, they don't seem to express the glycine transporter, which is used in, in clearing glycine. So glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, and this makes sense because the forebrain doesn't use glycine signaling, uh, at least not very much. Uh, it's used only in the, in the midbrain and hindbrain um, and a little bit in the olfactory bulb. Um, it also has clinical importance because glycine transporters are very important drug targets uh, that are in development for uh, neurological disorders. So this uh, in, suggests that in targeting those transporters, you will not be able to target the forebrain because they're not expressed. I want to make um, one point. We're talking a lot about cell types, and I showed you a very rigid uh, scheme where we try to find really well-defined cell types and ask about the distribution of those cell types. But it's important to understand that uh, the object that we are studying does not come in these neat categories. Um, uh, and I think the, 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 the molecular architecture of the brain that we discover shows very clearly that cell types are make sense only in the light of development. So we need to think about development when we're thinking about this. And if you go, all, all the work that I showed was from three week old mice. If you go just three weeks earlier, so this is just around birth, and you go to the hippocampus and sample it, you don't find cell types. You find a branching um, lineage tree or a, or a manifold, as we would call it, that has as its tips the cell types that will be present in, in, the, in the adult animal. So you have the astrocytes, the oligodendrocyte precursors, the granular cells, and the pyramidal cells of the hippocampus. These are probably f at least four different cell types there at the tips of those branches. So in studying um, the older animals and in applying this very rig rigid framework of, of discovering clean, separated cell types, we're actually only studying the tips of this object. Uh, whereas in reality, of course, this object is, is, is there and it has to be, we have to think about it as part of the thing that we're studying. We're not making an atlas of the tips of this iceberg. Uh, we're trying to make an atlas of the whole thing, uh, at least uh, uh, eventually. Um, and actually, this, this point is even more important in most other tissues. In the brain, there is not so much regeneration going on in the adult. But in most other tissues, you will find these kind of structures all the time. It's true, of course, of the skin, the intestine, and so on. So we should not think about it as neat categories of cell types, um, other than as a convenient abstraction to allow us to, to uh, perform our analysis. Another point I want to make is that once you have a catalog of, again, rigidly defined uh, neat uh, cell types, uh, you can start to leverage existing data. So this is an example where we have looked at GWA studies. In this case, it's uh, schizophrenia. Um, and we asked of the, of the genes that are uh, 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 significant in a GWAS study on, on, on schizophrenia that have a, uh, the, the lowest, if you rank them by p-value basically, um, how are they related to the genes that are expressed in specific cell types? And will this allow us to map schizophrenia genetics to specific cell types in the brain? And so here is a, an association plot showing the association between schizophrenia GWAS hits and gene expression in medium spiny neurons in the striatum. And you see there's a pretty good association and if you take a height instead, the GWAS for height, you don't see any association. And if you have a catalog of many cell types, you can now ask, where do we see this association? And indeed, you see this in specific cell types, in the pyramidal cells of the cortex and in the medium spiny neurons of the striatum primarily. So this is a way of actually um, taking the large body of existing genetic information and making it uh, uh, much more informative in terms of understanding disease mechanism and actually suggesting um, places and, and time points of intervention. Okay, and then a few words about um, how we might go about making a human cell atlas. Um, so in the human, um, 
of course, um, in the human brain, uh, neurons are, or cell types are usually not described in terms of molecules. We're described in terms of, of morphology and electrophysiology. So we need to align our atlas with all of that existing body of knowledge. That's, that's one axis. Another, of course, is transcriptomic cell type classification. We can do this in different ways and spatial mapping, as I said. And then the integration of this using a common coordinate fram framework. Um, the way we have to go about this in the brain, I think, is primarily through post-mortem tissue. Um, so we've set up a process where we um, work with uh, slabs. So we have a, you know, banked brains that are cut into slabs and they can be micro-dissected. And each uh, piece can actually be uh, dissected into a very fine structure. And this structure in itself can be mapped onto the common coordinate framework. So we know exactly where each piece comes from. Um, since it's frozen, we have to work with nuclear sequencing, and, and I think those technologies are, are becoming quite mature. On, on the spatial axis, um, technologies are much less developed. Uh, we are using uh, single molecule fish in a cyclic fashion that allows us to stain for, for several tens of genes. Um, the main bottleneck now is not uh, the number of genes, I think, but the amount of imaging. Uh, this is uh, extremely um, becomes extremely large, uh, uh, big data very quickly. Uh, we're doing this in mouse brain, but to scale it to human, it will scale way, way beyond terabytes. It will be petabytes of imaging. Uh, one way to scale it is to use more advanced imaging modalities like synthetic aperture optics um, that allow you to do uh, wide field imaging. And then the final step, um, we have actually in the brain, we're lucky to have already a pretty good common coordinate framework with an anatomical taxonomy mapped onto a, a 3D uh, reference brain. The problem is that people's brains that you find in, in, you know, in, in, from actual patients don't actually correspond to the reference brain. If you look at this part here and you try to compare it to this part here, you cannot just put them on top of each other. They're not aligned. So you need very flexible alignment schemes and this is actually a very big challenge. Um, if you're able to do this, you can now map it to a, a 3D volume and you know where, where you are. And you know, with a bit of luck, you can even try to uh, map very fine structures onto these tissues. So then, that's all. Thank you for me.